masterclass, we're going to go through the CE certification process versus the FDA strategy. I'm going to speak a little bit to the FDA strategy, and then Ronald's going to hop in and talk about the kind of current state of the CE certification. And then we're going to um, keep both of our presentations rather brief and hope to spend most of the time answering your questions um, at the end. So let's get started. Sean gave you an overview of me. I have been in medical devices for over 10, 20 years. I did serve a four year term as an industry representative on a FDA Good Manufacturing Practices Advisory Committee. Then I make a joke that I'm a master grief counselor because you're here, you probably already know the pain on both sides of the pond with the FDA and the MDR on the other side of the pond. This is my C-suite. They are currently asleep, but they might not stay that way. So I apologize for any extraneous noise. So let's get started. We're not they, seeing your slides. You can't? No. Yes, I, I can. Oh, you can? Yeah. Weird. Okay, okay sorry. Um, okay, I see some thumbs up that we're good to go. Great. Okay. Great. Um. So one of the first unique things about the U.S. compared to the, the methodology that the MDR classifies and the MDR uses like a rule-based approach, the FDA uses a risk-based approach that involves um, a level of different, different types of submissions based off of the risk structure of the product. So for, for super low risk devices, the pathway to market in the US might be a walk in the park in that it could be G, uh, at 510K exempt. It could also be GMP exempt. Um, then the next kind of risk class for like low and moderate risks is more like running a marathon. This is for um, class two products. And, and this is a 510K submission that's based off of a, a predicate or a substantial equivalence argument. Um, if you have kind of a, a maybe a, a medium risk product, but there doesn't exist a regulation or a product code, that's a little bit more like running a marathon. The FDA calls that de novo or of new. So for new and novel things that you don't anticipate being um, life sustaining, life supporting, um, you go through this uh, de novo process, and then you are most likely um, classified into this lower risk class two 510k product. Whereas those life supporting and life sustaining products, it's more like running an Ironman um, in terms of these are going to be pre-market approval. Um, they're going to require standalone safety and efficacy data and a lot of um, animal and clinical trials as well. So this is another unique thing about the U.S. market is the, the um, combination of different controls and exemptions available for each class of device. Um, and it's unique because you may have some exemptions in the U.S. For, for example, class one products um, are usually exempt from design controls. However, not even self-certified products in the EU are exempt from design controls. So what this means is not only can the type of submission and the, the level of information involved vary compared to the EU, but also the content of your quality management system. So if we look at how in the EU these types of submissions compare, um, the just the methodology of, of compare, uh, creating an argument for a successful 510K is based off of something called substantial equivalence, and it's a comparison to a predicate or an already legally marketed device that has an existing regulation and product code. Now, substantially equivalent doesn't mean it has to be identical. It just means that um, in terms of intended use and technology, it has to um, be similar enough that it's not raising new questions of safety and efficacy. But if you don't have enough similarities where you can make a substantially equivalent argument and you don't fall into an existing regulation, 
that means that you are new and novel, um, but you're moderate risk. So you you go for this de novo process in hopes of classification into a class two 510K for, for future products. Whereas again, that, that PMA pre-market approval has to have standalone scientific um, validity of safety and efficacy. In terms of, of length and kind of effort, you know, you're, you're ranging five, 1,500 plus pages, um, 1,500 for maybe a simpler type of product for a 510K, whereas you're in the range of about 4,000 pages for a de novo. And PMAs or the back when, in the days we used to print these are the equivalent of 30 plus three inch ring binders. Um, the other unique thing about the way the FDA processes submissions compared to the EU notified bodies is that the FDA has clock days that they are in metrics that they're measured internally on. So for a 510K, those clock days are 90 days. Um, however, roughly the average 510K takes about 200 days once you go through your additional information request and responses with the agency. Whereas de novos and PMAs, the clocks are 180 days for de novo, average of 400 days. PMAs, the average is about 800 days. Um, for pre-market approval, generally 510Ks and de novos don't have to have an inspection before you can um, uh, market your products. PMAs require a pre-approval inspection. Um, and again, compare and contrast anything besides the self-certified products uh, in the EU are going to require the notified body for both your quality management system and your um, submission technical file content. The user fees is another area where it varies greatly from, um, you, from the EU. These are fixed for the type of pro uh, submission that you have to do. And if you qualify as a small business, which means you're less than $100 million in revenue a year, you also qualify for a discount on these fees. Um, and it's important to note the terminology that goes with, with each. So for a 510K, you can say you have market clearance. De novo market clearance are granted. And only can you say FDA approval if you've gone through the PMA process. So some advantages of going to the US market first compared to the EU market. So in the US, the FDA is the only agency involved in um, uh, reviewing and, and approving or clearing products. So there overall is more consistency um, than the notified bodies. We are up to, uh, I believe over 40, nearly 50 notified bodies now. So these are independent for-profit organizations that are designated by different government bodies, but they are not government bodies in and of themselves. And each one of them has different interpretations. Also, once they provide a CE mark for your product, they become the defenders and responsible for your technical documentation in front of the national competent authorities or the, the equivalent of their in-country in, -country in um, FDAs. So the problem here is that each country in the European Union could have one, if not more, competent authorities that these notified bodies must um, interface with. So you can see how the number of both, um, you know, product, uh, agencies that are giving the approval for your product um, and the number of government agencies that they have to um, answer to kind of grows exponentially from the, the number and type of interactions that you could expect with the FDA. So what's happened recently um, with the MDR is that we've seen a shift in go-to-market strategy, especially for startups that may have new or novel products. It used to be that the US had a, re a reputation for requiring strenuous clinical studies and the EU had a reputation of ease of entry. But with the advent of the MDR, that these paradigms have totally shifted 
um, the, the time and cost that it takes to, to enter each. So if we look at those shifts in communication and budget, um, we see that the FDA offers many types of free interactions pre-FDA submission. Um, these are great ways of getting FDA's input and feedback on your technology. They even have special programs to create, um, uh, facilitate faster access and more collaboration with the agency. And then they have um, also low fee programs for you to get written confirmation of your classification and regulation. Um, during the, the review with the FDA submission, um, depending on your types, the fees here are fixed and you are not going to come up at the end of a, a submission review with an unexpected cost in terms of the actual agency fee. Whereas if we look at uh, from the notified body review, there really is no such thing as a free pre-review or interaction to find out where your notified body may stand on your particular technology or testing uh, theories. Just the application form and the process of getting uh, a quote itself is extremely tedious as that the notified bodies are um, at still at running at very limited capacity. Um, and just the application process alone, I've heard from different notified bodies, can take you know, six to nine months. Um, uh, the fees here are not fixed. You can go up to, uh, you know, they try to cap it at three rounds. I know a client that pulled out of a EU um, CE mark assessment early in the MDR process um, because they had hit over $100,000 in notified body fees alone, and they didn't feel like there was any end in sight. Um, so you just have to know that going in, that there, there's not going to be a fixed time or a goal time or cost. FDA also has a small business designation that can save you um, 50 to 75% depending on the type of submission that you, um, you have, you're going for. In terms of, uh, of the, that difference that I discussed about the pre-submission, this is a really powerful tool to be able to ask FDA specific questions related to your regulatory um, process and your technology. It gives you a snapshot of FDA's current thinking on, your pro on their product. And current thinking could mean um, other things that, that are under review but might not be cleared yet that, so you don't have visibility to things in the pipeline that might be coming. It could be maybe guidance documents that are in draft or being discussed internally in, in FDA that you also might not have visibility to. Um, that FDA will, will tell you more than you than is publicly available about your product. These are especially important if you have anything that is first of its kind or um, novel. And best of all, again, they are free. Other types of pre-submissions that can are advantageous are the breakthrough and the um, safer technologies program. With the FDA, these are different types of pre-submissions where you make a case um, where in the breakthrough, your product is more effective um, than uh, a more effective treatment of specifically life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating diseases. Whereas in the STEP program, you make a case that your devices are just reasonably expected to significantly improve the safety and availability of treatments. Um, but these conditions are less serious than those that are eligible for the breakthrough. But both provide you with an expedited access pathway, a more informal way to engage with the agency um, in terms of different types of discussions. And the goal is that the FDA becomes your collaborator and partner in bringing these important technologies to market. 
The other advantage, now this one's a, a double-edged sword. Um, on one hand, it's an advantage because it takes a lot of the guesswork out of um, assembling as a submission for the agency. It has a ton of help, te help text that help you identify the types of information that FDA is expecting. It links you to other FDA guidance documents. It has a completeness verification. So it takes a lot of the guesswork out of not only the preparation process, but things that you're gonna be asked during the review process. It also interfaces directly with the internal templates that the FDA uses to um, evaluate the submission. So what are your secrets to success for the US aid market? Well, first off, monitor those FDA guidance documents and updates and press releases it publishes so that you know uh, ahead of time what their current thinking could be. Become compliant with the quality management uh, system regulations, uh, the QMSR, um, as soon as possible. The clock is ticking. We have about a year and a half left before you need to transition your quality management system. Ensure that you've selected the right regulatory pathway via the pre-submission uh, confirmation via the pre-submission process with the FDA. And then make sure that you're using those pre-submissions to understand the FDA's position and to leverage the breakthrough and the step as much as possible to um, benefit from that expedited pathway. So there are a lot of resources um, to help you navigate all of this on my website. And then let me know how I can be helpful.